it's really a, a my pleasure and honor uh, to be invited here in Las Vegas CS and as well as uh, in uh, ICCE 2020. Uh, this is my first time uh, to present myself in this conference, but uh, I'm really um, excited to give you uh, some of my research result and the trend of autonomous driving happening in the world as well as in Korea uh, to you. Uh, this morning um, I've given uh, about 15 minutes and uh, try to give you uh, some of the summaries uh, what is a recent trend and what is the recent uh, advances of technologies for autonomous driving. Um, uh, you may be aware that if you uh, go to CES uh, uh, occurring from tomorrow, starting from tomorrow, autonomous driving, uh, or more generally speaking, autonomous uh, automotive area uh, related technology is uh, one of the key pillar areas in consumer le electronics technology. So it's not very surprising to give you the overview of autonomous driving in a consumer electronics society. Uh, the topic I'm going to uh, touch today is uh, on how to prepare good data for urban autonomous driving. The reason why, why I picked uh, up this uh, topic uh, for uh, today's keynote speech is, uh, um, of course, the main topic is autonomous driving, but uh, in preparing data uh, for uh, feeding the autonomous driving uh, system, is a really good and really important. So I want to uh, remind you uh, one of the uh, important areas uh, how we could prepare the technology for autonomous driving, especially in, in, in urban areas. <clears throat> um, before I start, I want to touch you some of my background, research background uh, on autonomous driving. I started my career uh, a long time ago. Uh, it's already been uh, 15 years in autonomous driving. But the real car development started from almost uh, seven or eight years ago. And uh, from 2014, I started to uh, uh, develop the real uh, commercial car platform based autonomous driving uh, vehicles. And uh, uh, since then, every year I try to um, um, launch a new a platform based uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. So 2015, 2016, or 2017, or even 18, uh, I have uh, been trying to uh, launch a new uh, platform and new vehicles. And uh, very luckily, uh, last year, 2019, uh, we've uh, launched a, a, a car called uh, Aligo. Uh, with the help of uh, one of the biggest uh, research, uh, retail chain store in Korea uh, called Eligo. I'm going to show you this video uh, in a few minutes. And uh, you may expect all kinds of uh, new vehicles will be launched th uh, this year. And hopefully, if I could have another chance to uh, share with you, I can introduce uh, that type of a new vehicle uh, this year. Um, um, as the professor mentioned uh, about me, I have been uh, working uh, on autonomous driving uh, uh, for a long period of time. But the uh, most recent one is called the Snoover. Uh, Snoover is a uh, um, uh, sedan-based, uh, uh, platform-based uh, autonomous driving vehicle. But uh, it's not a, uh, it's a perfect one. But uh, let me uh, start with uh, this video. <coughs> Um, this is the most recent um, autonomous driving uh, vehicle running in Seoul. And uh, we've been testing uh, this vehicle in uh, many different uh, driving environments and situations. And uh, we are trying to um, um, challenge and tackle uh, one of the difficult and hard scenarios we can encounter in real driving scenarios. So uh, we've been testing in uh, um, urban areas, of course, and uh, um, inside the buildings or um, garages or many different kinds of uh, challenging scenarios. And uh, um, you may guess that uh, this is a, uh, 
the only, I will say, the only vehicle running in, in the downtown of Seoul. So if you have a chance to uh, come to Seoul, you can see this video, or this, this vehicle, sorry, and, and being tested and being operated in the normal and, uh, urban environment. <coughs> Um, you may uh, be aware that the uh, urban driving scenario is uh, very, very challenging and uh, you may uh, encounter uh, very diverse uh, traffic scenarios and many vehicles and many pedestrians and uh, even um, bicycles and uh, there's so many uh, different scenarios you uh, can imagine. Especially uh, uh, right turn and left turns are very uh, hard scenario and narrow driving is another interesting and challenging scenario. You have to avoid and you have to understand the many diverse traffic scenarios as well. <clears throat> okay, uh, let me stop here. All right, um, let me go through uh, the main um, uh, topics I'm going to touch today, and let me uh, start with a uh, recent trend. <clears throat> I believe all of you will be aware that the key, key words in autonomous automotive industry can be summarized as a four words. One is a connected, and the second one is a autonomous, and the third one is a shared, and the last one is a electric. So we uh, call the, uh, the first, first character as a case, C-A-S-E. So case is, a, is a one of the distinctive words which can describe or fully describe the current auto automotive industry. Um, autonomous driving uh, has become a reality. It's not a kind of imaginations anymore. It's not, not futuristic technology. It's not kind of a, um, a long way uh, going technology is a reality. Uh, many of the OEMs, in, uh, we call OEM, is a car manufacturing companies. They already have been uh, developing and built autonomous driving technology vehicles uh, uh, recently, and they've been testing a lot of different different kinds of vehicles on a real road. And uh, you can see the many vehicles if you come to Silicon Valley or other other cities in, in the United States. And uh, uh, IT-related companies, especially in, in Google and Waymo, or Apple, or Intel, there are so many vehicles, vehicle, not non-traditional vehicle companies, but they've been working on autonomous driving technology development for a long period of time. <clears throat> but uh, uh, if, you, if you ask me to distinguish between two groups of uh, 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 technologies, I would say traditional auto-related companies, industry could be summarized as, a, as some words. Uh, they've, been, um, um, exp uh, they've been in a kind of a long development cycles, and uh, they've been good at replacement of a de de defective parts. It kind of, we call it uh, traditionally as an after-service, right? After-service after market or aftermarket. And uh, they don't um, tolerate uh, any fault that we call the zero fault strategy. And uh, they are very good at the linear supply contract. We call it supply chain mechanisms. And uh, this market of automotive industry is a purely pure buyer oriented. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are so many new market players are appearing network providers, software IT companies, or map providers, infotainment, or electronics, and sometimes we telecom companies. We call these companies as a software IT, a newcomer, but they have a pretty much a distinctive features from the traditional uh, auto industry companies. So uh, basically they have a short development cycles and uh, they are uh, very good at uh, very kind of regular, uh, software updated, and uh, um, they sometimes argue or claim that the software is not 100% um, faultless, right? And uh, their supply chain model is also very different. Uh, Multi-party uh, licensing models are, are typical or usual uh, supply chain model. 
and um, um, markets are are targeting. They are targeting is also very different. They are uh, uh, based on the mixed vendors or sometimes uh, uh, platform-based uh, markets. So um, traditional auto industry and uh, uh, new uh, market players are based on pretty much different kind of uh, market strategies. And the service perspective, uh, there are many different kinds of services already uh, being tested and uh, being undergone in, a, in, a, in our neighbors. You can see uh, many of the test vehicles in, in around the world uh, for shuttle services. So May Mobility or Navia in from France, or there are so many uh, shuttle development companies around the world. And in the same time, uh, different services like uh, um, last mile delivery has been another interesting area, interesting market spots uh, many, uh, many companies are focusing currently. Um, some of the, uh, or not, not some of the, many of the um, um, startup companies in Silicon Valley, uh, they have been invested a lot of money, a chunk of money from the investors and that they have been developing dedicated hardware platforms or vehicle platforms for, uh, especially for uh, delivery purposes. Um, um, if, if you have been in Tokyo Motor Show last year, uh, you uh, may, may have been aware that uh, uh, Toyota has announced uh, uh, pretty much a different uh, uh, vision for uh, mobility services in the future. So they call it E4Me, but uh, this platform could be utilized for many different kinds of platforms or many different kinds of businesses uh, for different pers uh, purposes, like uh, E-Tracer or E-Trans or E-Care with different names but the same platforms could be utilized for different platforms for many different kinds of goals. And the recently they also have, been, uh, have proposed a, a, a platform called the MicroPlat. Uh, and the uh, MicroPlat is another interesting platform and has been uh, used for diverse purposes. Um, <clears throat> Let me introduce um, some of our um, uh, research effort, not, uh, not development effort in, in Seoul. And uh, we have been testing, as, as I've shown you before, um, very uh, complex uh, um, urban areas. And uh, uh, let me show you one of the um, efforts in Korea. Um, this figure has been uh, developed for last month delivery purposes in Seoul, Korea, and uh, with the help of uh, eMart. And uh, if you order uh, some products from eMart, uh, there's kind of an interface you can uh, order for uh, delivery to your home, right? And you can you can enter your phone number or or some addresses or nearby kind of a pickup stations, and the car comes in and uh, you can open the door by using your smartphones. <clears throat> so, uh, the vehicle uh, picks up your uh, ordered uh, uh, products or goods and uh, it'll be loaded. Once it is loaded, the vehicle runs uh, um, autonomously. But of course, uh, uh, we need a kind of a safety driver at this moment because of the regulation purposes. But the vehicle runs uh, fully autonomously. So the, uh, once the customer uh, uh, dispatches their uh, goods uh, using the uh, autonomous vehicle, they just go home and uh, wait for the delivery of the products, right? And once the uh, vehicle arrives, um, it will be notified to the uh, customer and the customer will uh, understand, okay, uh, my, my goods or products uh, will arrive soon and uh, I'm gonna pick it up 
uh, a summer uh, I designated, or I can uh, ask them to deliver to my uh, uh, home in kind of a door-to-door -door manner, right? So uh, many of the uh, res uh, customers are um, living in the apartment complexes. So as I've said, uh, once the vehicle arrives, uh, the customer just approaches the vehicle and uh, open the door, open the gate, open the uh, cargo spaces, and uh, pick, picks it up. That's it. <clears throat> OK, uh, let me stop here. So. Um, this is kind of a, uh, one of the um, uh, uh, proof of concept uh, test services which have been conducted uh, for a couple of months in Korea. And uh, uh, we've been enlightened uh, from many medias and uh, from uh, many uh, uh, companies. And uh, we are looking forward to developing next versions of uh, uh, vehicle platforms uh, 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 from next year. All right. Um, uh, let me uh, go ahead to the uh, motivations. Okay, so technology-wise, uh, core steps of an uh, algorithmic process for autonomous driving uh, could be summarized as uh, three parts. The one is uh, sensing, second one is uh, computation, the third one is uh, machine learning. The machine learning uh, nowadays covers uh, many of diverse and knowledges and uh, areas called uh, deep learning. I'm going to touch uh, one by one, <clears throat> except for computations. So uh, sensor-wise, uh, we have to have to employ uh, many diverse uh, sensor suites, uh, including uh, cameras or lidars or radars or sometimes GPSs. There's so many uh, different types of sensors with uh, different uh, specifications. But uh, uh, many sensors uh, should be employed to cover uh, different areas or uh, different levels of uh, autonomy. So if you uh, consider uh, level one or level two, a low, pretty much low levels of uh, um, autonomy, you may uh, want to uh, employ a few, uh, a few uh, fewer number of sensors, but uh, if you'd like to cover more uh, deeper areas on, on, uh, on autonomy, uh, you have to employ many different kinds of or diverse uh, suites of sensors uh, for different pur uh, purposes. Um, especially for camera sensors, uh, nowadays uh, most of the recent uh, vehicles are employing more than 20 uh, sensors, camera sensors especially, for front side or inner side or front side and rear side or sometimes uh, outside or um, front, front outside or front inner side. So each of the uh, camera sensors cover uh, different um, areas or without um, leaving the um, uh, blind spots. So that's why we are employing uh, many different kinds of sensors um, in a different way. And another example of a sensor called a LiDAR, you may be aware very well about the LiDAR sensors, but the LiDAR sensors is, a, is kind of a, uh, basically a scanning sensor, right, scanner. So it covers uh, um, uh, front areas or sometimes uh, 360 degrees on, and in, in diverse directions. But the recently, uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, 360 degree rotating sensors, uh, we have kind of a fixed view sensors as well. And uh, uh, many of the Silicon Valley-based uh, um, companies are, are being uh, producing uh, um, kind of a fixed uh, view uh, sensors. Um, especially uh, for LiDARs, uh, this, uh, the market has been very competitive recently. And um, uh, I would say more than 50 uh, companies are, are being developing or uh, doing researches on uh, LiDARs. So small scale or mid scale or large scale, large distance sensors. So there are so many different kinds of, a variety of different kinds of uh, LiDAR sensors in the market. So it's your choice and you can choose uh, uh, any of these uh, um, uh, selections from the market and you can uh, equip um, uh, for your vehicles for different pur uh, purposes. Um, sensors are advancing uh, every year, I would say. 
and uh, uh, from the current ADA systems to uh, future ADA and a autonomous driving uh, systems, uh, different, different sensors have different kinds of characteristics and different specifications. Increased uh, angular and range resolutions or increased uh, range capabilities or field of view coverages or communication, communicating um, uh, data rates and the centralized computing uh, capabilities or sometimes it increases scalability. So many different sensors have many different kinds of specifications, characteristics. So again, it's your choice. But the, the bottom line is uh, every year sensing uh, sensor capabilities and sensor specifications are, are innovating, being innovated and uh, advancing um, as uh, more than we expected. Um, at this point, I have to uh, give you uh, kind of a, a basic uh, differences between the uh, ADAS as well as uh, fully autonomous driving. Um, uh, sometimes uh, uh, people are confusing these two uh, terminologies uh, uh, with each other, but uh, basically they are very different. So driver assistance is basically uh, driver supporting, right? But autonomous driving is uh, replacing the driver, and the objectives are, of course, different. And the hardware requirements are, of course, different. And for autonomous driving uh, perspective, uh, hardware requirement is much, much uh, tougher. And uh, we, uh, some, uh, many cases, we need a redundant uh, sensing and compute actuations. And the data requirement is, uh, is also very different. Uh, for autonomous driving, uh, for uh, data requirement is, uh, is for uh, viable actions or complying the rules of the road, or uh, we have to, um, um, uh, respect uh, actual actor behaviors or typical uh, driver behaviors. So, so again, um, I'd like to emphasize once more the autonomous, fully autonomous driving uh, capability is uh, far beyond the level of uh, uh, driving assistance, right? Okay, uh, so autonomous uh, uh, driving uh, perspective, we uh, need a kind of a, um, a very uh, finely tuned setting up, setting uh, of, of the sensors. Um, normally speaking, uh, sensors are, are equipped in a kind of a sensor fusion manner. So many different sensor types are, are used uh, uh, at the same time for sensor fusion perspective. So typical uh, sensors uh, we normally use are uh, cameras as well as uh, uh, LiDAR and radars, right? And uh, um, especially uh, LiDARs, I believe all of you know about cameras well, so I don't want to, too much, uh, to touch too much about the camera sensors, but I want to give you kind of a more insight about the uh, LiDAR sensors. LiDAR sensors has been, become, again, very important in, in recent times but they are very good at measuring the distances to a target by eliminating the tar uh, laser beams and uh, measuring the time of flight, right? So they are very uh, a good source of, uh, of uh, data uh, gathering of the object. And uh, the, the data we gather from the LiDAR sensors are used for detecting the uh, location or shape or doing, doing the classification of the, of, of the object. Um, the radar is another important so, uh, sensor, and we use uh, very heavily and heavily in recent times. But uh, uh, basically, a radar is a kind of uh, a collect. It's also collecting the, the points, so we call it point cloud. But the uh, um, uh, much sparser the uh, lidar sensors. But the and the fourth generation of the radar uh, recently, uh, companies are manufacturing is uh, is getting uh, is providing more uh, data points so it's a much denser uh, um, uh, point cloud just like uh, uh, lidar all right uh, so with the data we gather from different sensors uh, what, what kinds of tasks do we perform uh, most of the typical uh, tasks we do uh, uh, include uh, segmentations or uh, object detections or classifications or scene understanding or object uh, tracking or mapping. These are some, uh, some of the basic uh, functions that we normally do uh, with the data we gather from the sensors. But uh, um, again, I have to emphasize uh, uh, the, the complexity of uh, urban uh, driving. As I mentioned a few times, um, it's really, really challenging uh, uh, to do the urban driving uh, with the current autonomous driving technologies. Um, the reason is uh, we have to um, tackle, uh, we have to challenge it, 
uh, multi-object detection or multi-object tracking or multi, uh, predictions as well. So you can see the kind of tra tra trajectory of the vehicles, right? So we have to understand the, all the trajectories of the future trajectories of the, of the nearby vehicles, how they will behave, how do we, uh, the motion, right, in a different uh, um, directions. So it's very challenging. Um, <clears throat> let me uh, uh, give you a, a quick example how we do the uh, multi-object detection uh, using the technologies. Um, again, I'm, 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 I'm showing you a similar videos, but uh, this video includes a uh, uh, primitive... Uh, interesting de de uh, detection result or detection activities we are doing. So it's again urban driving. So, you know, uh, right upper corner, uh, you can see uh, multi-object detection result, right? So each of the objects are, are individually detected and they are um, tracking, right, individually as well, okay? Of course, they are, uh, we are using a, a three-dimensional map. So the, uh, the object detection uh, uh, covers uh, many different objects like uh, vehicles or um, pedestrians or bicyclists and uh, other uh, small objects as well. And this is a uh, detection result uh, based on the scanner and uh, so basically the scanning, right? But the scan the result is also fused uh, with the camera data, so uh, based on the sensor fusion technology. So sensor fusion is basically merging these two data together so that, so that we can improve the sensing or detection capabilities. So of course uh, we have to detect uh, 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 light, uh, uh, traffic light as well, and the traffic uh, signals as well. So you can see uh, more clearly with uh, uh, wider pictures. So individual objects should be uh, uh, detected and tracked. Okay, uh, let me stop here. All right. So um, again, um, the uh, object detection in in urban driving is uh, again very very challenging uh, issues. Um, so um, if I jump to into um, another um, areas, another issue. So in order to do the um, 
object detection or tracking or object trajectory uh, in urban driving, uh, we have been adopting a new technology called uh, deep learning, right? Uh, I believe you all know, uh, very much well known about uh, uh, deep learning. But the mostly uh, deep learning, what the deep learning does is uh, uh, firstly training the network to learn to do a specific task, as I mentioned. So using the input data uh, and the training the neural network and uh, we, with the uh, train the model, uh, we uh, use a new input data and to get the specific task. That's kind of a normal norms of uh, of deep learning. But the uh, the question is uh, for deep learning uh, processes, if we use uh, the raw data as an input, does it work or not? So that's kind of a basic question we started from the beginning and. Uh, 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 we try to get an answer for this question for a long, long time. <clears throat> uh, the answer basically is a, is a no. The reason is there's so many problems we can, we have to overcome to utilize the raw data for deep learning perspective. The first problem is uh, related to kind of a point cloud data. And point cloud data is a more, is a very problematic uh, data sources. Uh, uh, let me show you some kinds of examples. Uh, let's say, let's start with the ideal point cloud. And uh, sometimes the point clouds are occluded with a different object. And uh, uh, the point cloud data are in many cases very sparse, right? So you don't expect, you can, you can gather enough point cloud for enough, in, enough um, uh, for your um, real applications. So in many cases, point clouds are very sparse. Uh, especially as a uh, uh, distance becomes uh, um, uh, longer, the number of points you can gather from the sensors becomes uh, sparser. So it's basically sparse point cloud. And uh, in, in other cases, uh, uh, these point clouds are also sliced, right? These are segmented and, uh, and separated, and you can, uh, you can uh, understand which components are, are, are which object related. So you have to have a way to reassemble these two segmented or sliced point cloud parts into a single uh, um, object. And, uh, <clears throat> let me uh, go into more deeply, uh, one by one. Uh, if you have a kind of a occlusion, right? As I mentioned, that you have kind of a missed uh, 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 point cloud, right? In order to solve this problem, you have to kind of uh, have some solutions uh, like uh, reconstruction or augmentation, right? Um, a cloudy point cloud, uh, uh, in many cases, uh, give you a very, very uh, headache in, in learning. For example, um, scene flow, uh, if you if like to gather a, get the scene flow, and uh, if you use uh, a cloudy point cloud as input data sources, and if you run um, the, uh, or, uh, or t train the system in every epoch, you can get a kind of a, a diverged right, um, result uh, called the unstable training losses. Right? So it's not a really good idea to use uh, um, uh, a cloudy point cloud for training uh, purposes. So that's why, that's one of the motivation why you have to have a perfect or complete data for deep learning uh, training. And another uh, problem you can, you can um, have in, in many normal situations of, of, of deep learning is related to the sparseness. As I've said, as I mentioned, uh, uh, depending on the uh, sensors, you might have uh, a little bit denser or sometimes a little bit more sparser data. If you use uh, uh, better senses, more expensive LiDAR sources, you can get a somewhat um, denser, but if you use a cheaper senses like a 16 channel so of LiDARs, you, you, you should have uh, uh, sparser uh, data points. For these kinds of problems, you have to have uh, another solution called uh, augmentations or recon reconstruction, or sometimes we, you need um, accumulations. Um, 
Another interesting uh, example why you need a kind of a more complete data sources is uh, related to uh, mapping, right? Um, I don't know if you know um, uh, how, mu how much you know about the mapping, but the mapping is, a, is a another process uh, you, you, you use uh, with the data, right, uh, from the point cloud. So mapping is basically kind of accumulations of the data points you gathered from the sources and uh, make kind of a complete view or complete uh, environment in a three-dimensional or uh, in a high-definition manner. So using the 64-channel point cloud, you may, uh, you, sh you may have a kind of complete uh, mapping result, but if you have uh, um, fewer uh, data points, you may lose uh, the, the completeness, right? So we call it failed uh, uh, closed loop. So you cannot have a kind of a closed loop of the, uh, of the mapping result uh, due to the likeness or sparseness of the data. Um, <clears throat> another example of, uh, of, uh, um, of the problem of a sparse, a sparse data point is, is also related to the mapping. Um, if you use a, a field of view uh, data point uh, gathered from field of view 360 degrees, you might have kind of a, a, a complete mapping result as well. But uh, if you use a, a, a lesser, a smaller field of view data, uh, kind of a, a awkward, right? Awkward uh, mapping result. So the left, left one is, uh, is a good one, and but the right one is a wrong one, right? Okay. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, another uh, problem is uh, sometimes if you reconstruct the environment in a three-dimensional way, you should have uh, different kinds of angles or different kinds of viewpoints uh, for the same object. From, from this angle or a different angle, you have to combine two angles together to, um, to, give, uh, to have the kind of a full uh, view of a different object. Uh, for these uh, purposes, you have to have a, have a solution called uh, accumulations, right? from different angle should be combined together and accumulated to have a full picture of the same object. All right, so um, I've shown you uh, many different um, examples or count examples why we need um, um, kind of a mechanisms or solution to handle the data uh, or sparse or uh, incomplete data to make it complete. So, um, we need anyway uh, some mechani mechanisms or some way for data re re refinement for uh, deep learning. So for input data, before you input the data to feed uh, to the uh, deep learning processes, you have to have uh, steps to refine or make, it, make them complete, right? To uh, make the training or testing uh, more successful. Right? So input data should be combined with the pre-processing pre uh, processes uh, for the, before it is, uh, they are fed into the deep neural networks. Of course, after training steps, you also need uh, uh, data pre-processing pre steps as well uh, for, uh, for utilizing the training uh, models for specific tasks. <coughs> um, there are uh, many uh, research articles or um, documents uh, which supports uh, this claim. Um, for um, specific uh, application of AI for producing any products in a, in a company-wise, um, from uh, framing opportunity hypotheses and data uh, preparations in modeling, deployment, or iterations, evaluation, these kind of uh, full cycles of uh, utilizing or application of AI technology for developing uh, processes. But uh, in this full uh, productization processes, uh, data related or data handling um, um, uh, areas are very influential and very important. Uh, labeling data is almost 15% of your effort and the loading and the augmentation of data is a more or less a 40% of your full data preparation uh, uh, stages. And uh, um, other line of inferences or other steps are pretty much uh, minor compared to the data preparation, right? So uh, if I iterate once more, um, considering the full uh, product productizations of our processes, uh, cleaning up data 
is uh, almost 60% over your full uh, effort, productization effort uh, for applications of AI technologies. So again, so data cleaning up and the data preparations, preparations uh, processes are a major two or one or two important steps, right? You have to be very seriously considering. Okay, uh, let me go back to the deep learning pr procedures uh, once more, and uh, let me uh, segment uh, data uh, 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 deep learning trainings and uh, um, testings in two steps. So for training purposes, you use uh, training data. Of course, for testing purposes, you use uh, testing data, right? However, uh, let's say uh, these two data sets are related to Two uh, domain, uh, two domains. So let me call it domain first, first domain, or domain second, second domain. Right. So we're assuming that uh, for domain one, we are using uh, training data, and the domain two will be using uh, uh, domain uh, uh, testing domain testing data. Some of the examples are uh, different. Uh, different uh, different domains uh, are related to uh, different. Uh, um, uh, sensors or different uh, data uh, perspective like uh, uh, synthetic data or real data or uh, uh, different regions like uh, country one or country two. So these are different data sets uh, correspond to uh, different uh, domains, right? Okay. Okay. So if we define the two different domains, we can um, uh, classify so to the technologies in, in uh, single sensor domain versus multiple sensor domain, right? So I'm going to uh, very briefly cover uh, one by one uh, since, since we are uh, running out of time. So uh, data pre-processing techniques, I'm going to show you uh, one by one you know, in a very quick manner. Uh, so image-wise, image uh, so uh, data uh, Reconstructions and completion related to the uh, many pre-existing technologies. So we call the uh, some of the well-known technologies called uh, super resolution, and the super resolution uh, basically uh, does is uh, from resolution, low resolution to high resolution uh, images, and uh, some of the missing uh, images are also reconstructed uh, based on the image re uh, completion technology. Uh, so master images are completed. Uh, into a more uh, reconstructive version. Uh, so if you go back to the three-point cloud, uh, three-point cloud uh, um, reconstructions, uh, basically it's, uh, it's uh, 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 recent technologies uh, is relying on the convolutional neural networks, and uh, uh, some of some of these are uh, CNN based or sensor fusion based or model based or GAN based, right? So uh, one of the uh, well-known technology is based on the uh, uh, convolutional neural network technology. So convolutional network neural te technology is a is a very sup sup uh, superior in doing the detection of object, but it's also very good at uh, reconstruction purposes. So um, if we uh, employ the um, the combination of encoder and decoder. We can extract the feature vectors from the input data points, and uh, we could do the uh, regeneration of output point cloud from the feature vectors we gathered from the encoders. So, uh, some of the missing components of the missing data could be reconstructed using the uh, CNN, and uh, we can we may we should be able to get the more complete or reconstructed versions of the uh, object. And the second uh, uh, interesting technology we heavily use is based on the sensor fusion technology. And again, sensor fusion technology is very good at uh, object detection purposes, but it's also very good at uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, reconstruction purposes. And uh, sensor fusion is basically uh, relying on the ideas or a concept of the complementary characteristics of different sensors. Um, assuming we use uh, camera sensors as well as uh, LiDAR sensors, they have uh, pretty much different kinds of char characteristics. As you uh, know very well, um, the camera sensors are as uh, rich uh, features, uh, but it's only two-dimensional. 
However, point cloud is, uh, uh, is, is giving us uh, very accurate three-dimensional information, but uh, it's very sparse and uh, un un unordered. So, um, so classical fusion technology is uh, just kind of complement with, uh, with each other and uh, giving uh, each other uh, their own uh, kind of a characteristic information so that we can uh, uh, have a more enriched uh, point cloud or more, uh, more information uh, embedded in uh, image, uh, images of ca from camera sensors. Um, again, uh, CNN um, technology is uh, very common in, in the 3D uh, reconstruction purposes. So sparse point cloud data are combined with the color images uh, and, of, and they are fed it into the uh, sensor fusion of, uh, uh, based on the CNN and uh, more uh, depth uh, information embedded prediction uh, results uh, could be uh, obtained. <coughs> Um, this, uh, recently, uh, this technology is also known as, uh, uh, as a research area called uh, depth completion. So depth completion is another research, uh, very hot research area in, uh, in images or object detection areas. But the basic idea is uh, using the sparse depth images and the color images and uh, we e extract uh, um, uh, features from different sources and uh, extracted sources are combined with each other uh, to get uh, more enriched data result uh, uh, based on these two uh, sensor um, uh, sources. So depth completion uh, idea is uh, very much related to the three-dimensional reconstruction technologies that we are considering uh, today. Uh, these are kind of some of the videos, uh, uh, result videos. Uh, the the top one, uh, I, I don't think you can uh, see very clearly, but uh, basically the, the top uh, portion of this video shows uh, images and uh, sparse uh, point cloud, but the half bottom uh, images show you much uh, denser predictions uh, with the distance information as well as uh, camera pixel information. So, uh, so depth completion, is uh, one of the key and important technology we heavily utilize for um, um, uh, gathering more, uh, 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 extracting more information from different sources of uh, sensor sources. Uh, uh, because of time limitation, I'm gonna skip this one. Uh, another um, technology we, we could uh, consider is, uh, uh, is also based on the uh, CNN but uh, we uh, also employ basic uh, three-dimensional model. And uh, again, from th uh, 3D point cloud, and we use a basic 3D models, and we can get an, a more uh, complete versions of a three-dimensional object of the, uh, of the sources. All right, the last one I'm going to touch you, uh, touch today is, uh, is based on the GAN. Uh, I think you all know about the GAN technology very well, but the GAN has been uh, pretty much um, uh, popular uh, recently because of their um, powerfulness uh, in 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 kind of a regenerative as a regenerative uh, technology. Um, all of the faces you you can uh, you see uh, in these slides are are fake, unfortunately. They are they are kind of a regenerated images. They are not real, so. Um, we can't really distinguish what is real and what is fake uh, uh, from the GAN technology. So, so GAN technology has been uh, very popular in, 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 mono, in, in, in many of the uh, AI areas, but it is also uh, being popular in the 3D reconstruction areas. So from the uh, sparse point cloud, and the generator generates more expanded point cloud, and the dis discriminators try to uh, distinguish which one is fake and which one is real, and uh, the uh, this, this discriminated result will be uh, fed into the generator as uh, with a confidence value, and if the confidence value becomes higher and higher, uh, the generator should be able to generate more um, uh, real data uh, from the sparse data. So it's this basic idea of the, of the GAN technology, right? 
So again, game technology has been very popular and has been very uh, proved very, very, very uh, powerful. And this technology has also been used very popular in 3D uh, reconstructions for the missing information. And the, the left hand side is, uh, uh, sorry, the upper, upper, upper side of the images are, are sparse data we, we input uh, for the GAN and the GAN output uh, more uh, denser uh, data uh, as we expected. Okay. Um, okay, another um, um, area you may get interested in is called accumulation. So accumulation is basically sparser data points are accumulated together so that we can get a kind of a more denser data, right? So, so basically what, what it does is try to kind of uh, match uh, two different um, um, data points in a, in a, in a kind of a, uh, uh, aligned manner. So we call, uh, we use, uh, we, we sometimes we use called the uh, technology iterative closet point, ICP. ICP has been very popular uh, for um, accumulating pr uh, purposes, but the interesting point and powerfulness of ICP is uh, we don't uh, really need kind of a GPS information. So without GPS information, we can very successfully accumulate two um, sparse images together, right? So that we can get much uh, denser images. All right, um, the last part I'm gonna touch today is uh, um, uh, uh, two domain related technologies. So from domain one and domain two um, for um, different pur uh, purposes or different uh, data types or different locations and the different orientation object, uh, we, uh, sometimes we use uh, different sensors. And for, for example, for domain one, uh, for example, you, you train the data, you train your system using 16-channel uh, LiDAR data. But however, you may want to expand or uh, testing your um, uh, deep learning system using the 64-channel LiDARs, right? In this case, uh, we have to use a different sensor for different domains. Uh, the recent technology for these purposes is, uh, is related to uh, domain adaptation technology uh, in images. For um, 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 synthetic data, uh, you, for, you generate for training purposes, um, you have to get an uh, image function or transfer function uh, so that you can transfer the synthetic data into a real data, right? So basically you need a real data for Im improving the performance of, performances of, uh, of a deep learning system. But uh, uh, you have to have a kind of a, um, a generative function uh, which can map from the synthetic data uh, to the uh, real data for uh, training purposes. So the left hand side is uh, image data or synthetic data you, uh, you generate uh, from the computer. But the, this data is not enough for training purposes, all right? So you have to um, transfer that synthetic data for more or less real data, okay, uh, for uh, training purposes, right? Okay, uh, I think most of the time is up. Uh, I have to conclude. All right, uh, I've skipped, uh, uh, skipped uh, a few slides. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so as conclusions, again, the challenges of uh, urban autonomous driving, I've emphasized a few times. And uh, understanding the environment is very, very challenging. Okay. And uh, I also emphasize the uh, importance of uh, uh, obtaining uh, good quality of data like this, not this, like this, right? So uh, uh, data processing and uh, uh, its management has become uh, very important. And uh, getting high quality data is, uh, is preferable, but in many cases it's not possible. So, uh, parallel efforts should be uh, made to make the data uh, more useful uh, through uh, pre-processing or uh, for object reconstruction or eliminations, right? And uh, uh, very luckily, uh, lots of research efforts on pre-processing are being made and uh, it's uh, your choice or our choice which take, uh, technique 
uh, we are going to utilize. Uh, this is the last one last slide, and uh, uh, I want to emphasize uh, the autonomous vehicle is uh, is a part of uh, kind of a big um, ecosystem uh, for a data world. So for automotive uh, areas, there are so many data related, like uh, manufacturing data or sales data or even technology re related data. But the but the the, the technique which I've shown you introduced today is only only a part of a big automotive community or automotive areas, right? But the, um, all of the data should be uh, refined or augmented in some way to be, uh, to be utilized for uh, future good uh, purposes and goals, right? So currently, uh, we are heavily utilizing uh, deep learning technology, but the deep learning technology uh, requires uh, good quality or more refined data for training purposes, right? Okay, uh, that's it for, uh, that's all, all for today. And uh, thank you very much for your attention, attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer after uh, my sessions. Thank you again.